Good morning. Glad to be with you this morning. If you're watching this online, uh, we're running a little bit late, but uh, anyway, uh, we've already been having service, but thank you for being with us. Uh, we already prayed over the word this morning, and we're glad you're here with us. But anyway, um, we are doing this because of the music, trying to get the music to sound right on the, when it comes out the other end, when you're watching out there. So maybe we'll have it straightened out next week and be back at 1030. We'll see, hopefully. Um, we'll just move on from there. Uh, if you would, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 18, verse 1. We're going to be talking about faith this morning. Jesus said, when I return, when the Son of Man returns, will I find faith? Right. People everywhere say, oh, I, I have faith. I have faith. One man, uh, his son, the, the disciples were, they tried to cast the devil out of him, but they couldn't. And they said, Lord, why, why come we couldn't? It means they tried, they had some faith that they thought they should be able to. And they said, Lord, why couldn't we do it? The Lord cast him out, but they said, Lord, why couldn't we do it? And he said, because of your unbelief. See, we are a spirit. We live in a body, and we have a soul which makes up our mind, our will, and our emotions. And the Romans chapter 12 tells us to be not conformed like the world or to the world. Don't think like the world does. See, God's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. It operates almost 100% different than the natural kingdom. Right. You know, the natural world says, what do they say? Get all you can and set on your can, something like that. And Jesus said, give. It'll be given unto you. I mean, that's just one area, but there, there's so many. I mean, people think that they look at Jesus and they say, well, oh, but that was Jesus that cast out that devil. That was Jesus that walked on the water. That was Jesus that healed the blind man. That was Jesus that caused the lame to walk. Well, other people have done it too. I've never uh, caused a lame man to walk, but I've seen, I've seen a lot of things happen. I've seen people, uh, three, three or four people come up off of deathbeds when they said they couldn't. I've seen a lot of, I'd say they're minor. You know, I mean, when uh, we've seen a lot of things happen, though. I've seen, uh, I've been in the middle of casting out devils. I mean, people that were really demon-possessed. And it's still happening today. They're real. Jesus talked about it a lot. But still, we have to walk in unwavering, or one place he calls it un feigned faith, unwavering faith. We have to be so convinced of it that it doesn't matter what it looks like, what it feels like, and if everybody in the world is against us on it, we're willing to stand based on not just, well, this is the way I believe. Well, you better be believing on because this is what the Word says. Right. Not because of, this is, well, this is the way I was raised and it's just the way our denomination believe. Well, why do you believe that way? Have you been in the scriptures yourself and backed it up? Not just one set of scriptures. You know, you can take a scripture and pull it out of context. But if you read the whole chapter, sometimes you'll have to read a few chapters, sometimes the whole book, to get the meaning to see what that one verse is talking about. And then you should be able to see a theme throughout the Bible. Anything that you believe should let every word be basically set in stone by two or three witnesses. Meaning, you can have more than one scripture. You need to have more than one scripture that you're basing your belief on. And then if you do that, see, I always picture it as like a, uh, a firm foundation. Maybe it's a body of water around you or, or you're standing out on a pinnacle in the Grand Canyon somewhere. The bigger you can build your base, the bigger you can build the platform that you're standing on, if you do stumble a little bit. You're not just going to fall off in the deep. You, you've got something. You build your platform bigger and bigger. And by that, I'm talking about build your platform, your faith with the Word of God. Make, you know, whenever opposition comes against you on whatever it is, you have so many scriptures built up in you that it doesn't matter. I mean, when you come at the enemy, the devil, with the scripture, he's going to come back at you with one. More likely, he'll hit if you're spiritual at all. He's going to hit you with the word first. He did with Jesus. He said, didn't the scripture say? He's twisting them. 
Didn't the scriptures say this? And Jesus had, he had been studying the scriptures. We don't know how old he was when he started studying, but at the tw age of 12 years old, it said he astonished the religious leaders, the doctors of the law, if you will, in the time that he was living in. He astonished them at the information he had, at the questions that he was asking. They said, you know, how does a 12-year-old know all this? And the questions he, what he was doing is he was questioning them about some of their beliefs, probably. Yeah. You know, some of the things that they were, they were missing it. We know they missed it because they looked him right in the face and a few years down the road when he was turned 30 years old, roughly. And there's, there's some law, legal stuff about his age. But we don't get, we're not getting to that today. But anyway, at that age, they looked him right in the face. They looked at God. God was in him just like he's in you. God's eye, God was looking out through the eyeballs of Jesus. He was looking right at those people. It said the creation that he created, they looked at him and they, they didn't know him. and know who he was. So Jesus was astonishing them at 12 years old. You know, and we think people got to be young adults or something before we can start teaching them about God. You know, that's where the character's built in all of us is from the very youngest age. And then when we get older... It's like an oak tree's built up on the inside of us. We're not going to be moved. No, the, I, this is, I know what I believe. And I'm not going to move off of it. I don't care what my denomination or what anybody else believes. I've been in the Word and I know what the Word says. I know what the Word says. And unless you can show me something different, I'll be open-minded and listen. I won't argue. I'll listen to what you have to say. And if it lines up, okay. But if it doesn't, I'm not going to move until I see different. Amen? And my doctrine have changed. A few little things have changed over the years. Well, a lot of things. Well, some big things. Grace, grace has changed drastically. Yeah. Amen? But anyway, Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Jesus talking here. It said, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Not to faint. You know, um, well, let me move on. And there was a widow in that city. You know, especially in Bible times, I have to stop along the way. That's just who I, what I do. Widows in that time, in biblical days, you know, they kept the house, basically. They weren't in the farmers and stuff like that, but widows, when they became a widow, they were, they were considered very vulnerable. And they were very dependent on other people. And they needed help. They needed help. They, in a sense, they couldn't help themselves. You know, the Bible even talks about if it's a, a widow indeed in the New Testament. I think it said above the age of 60. And a widow indeed, it said the church should take care of the widows. So anyway, it said there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him. I missed something here. Verse 2. And saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, the same city the judge was in. And she came unto that unjust judge, saying, Avenge me of my adversary, my enemies. Those that are doing me wrong, taking advantage of me. Situation's not right. I need some help. I'm vulnerable. You know... The Bible says if we humble ourselves before God, before God, He will lift us up in due time. If we cast all our care on Him because He cares for us, it didn't mean that He, he really cared. He said, yeah, I say, boy, that's a bad situation. You, I feel bad for you. No, that's not the care He's talking about. He said, if you'll give it to Him, but you've got to have faith in it. He said, He'll take care of it for you. If you put your faith and trust in Him, he said, avenge me of my adversary. And it said, the unjust judge, he would not for a while, but afterward. He said within himself, though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest her continual coming she weary me. She's aggravating me. Don't think that uh, he's trying to say that this is the way God is. 
Because most of the time, that's the way people take it. He, that he's trying to picture, paint a picture of, you've got to just keep lambasting God to get him to move for you. No, that's not so. That's bad doctrine. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God, he said, Here's, this is what the unjust man did. He, he didn't care about the woman. He didn't care if she was needy or not. He didn't care. The only reason he was doing anything is he was thinking about himself. He said, I don't want her pestering me anymore, so just do what you can and fix it. He said, hear what the unjust judge says, and shall not God avenge his elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Now, let's back up here and look at these couple of scriptures. It says, hear what the unjust judge says, and then it connects it with a conjunction word. Hear what the unjust judge says, and shall not God avenge his elect which cry unto him day and night? Well, it says, though he bear long. Well, who is he talking about bearing long? Is he talking about God's bearing long? Well, I mean, it's so much easier to explain this because of what verse 8 says. He said, no, I tell you, he will avenge them, what, speedily? How can you avenge speedily and bear long at the same time? You can't. He's talking about the unjust judge. He said, Shall not God avenge his elect, which cry unto them day and night? Though he, the unjust judge, may have bared long. It may, he didn't care. Now, sometimes we think God is, is stretching and holding back on us, but he, in one sense, he can't. There is a law of faith. And if you use the law of faith, now, we don't push God's buttons and pull his levers like we do a computer program. I learned that the hard way. But God's not holding back. If you, well, maybe I better get into that a little bit later. But anyway, he said, so, I mean, if you look at verse 8, how can God do two things at one time? How can he avenge you speedily and then bear long at the same time? You can't do that. He was, Jesus was talking about the unjust judge. It said he, he wouldn't avenge her, but she just kept on pestering him kept on pestering him, and people read this as if Jesus is saying, well, now this is the way God is. If you want something from him, you know, you just got to keep pounding on the door. You just got to keep pounding on God's door to get him to do something for you. Well, Jesus said no. He said, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Y'all with me? You can chew on that. You can go back and look at it this week. And that's the Holy Spirit. He said, nevertheless, when the, he said, nevertheless about this, he said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Right. A lot of people talk faith. They got faith, maybe, maybe they got some head knowledge, but it hadn't got into their heart yet. That's right. Because pure, unwavering faith, see, God's not holding back on us. He has, through the new covenant, he has already provided everything that you and I will ever need. I know I say this a lot, but uh, when salvation was brought into the picture, I mean, he painted a picture all the way from the first man, Adam and Eve, where he covered them with a coat of skin. You ever thought about it? You ever took, seen an animal, when the skin comes off of it, it's a bloody mess. Yeah. Something had to die. So... When he presented salvation under the new covenant, does he bear long? Do you have to sit there and plead and beg God to get born again? No, it's, he's already said it. God doesn't have to do anything else. Jesus already went to the cross. Salvation, that word salvation, it encompasses the, uh, the whole package. What they call it when you go on a, a trip somewhere and everything, all inclusive. First time I... Heard that, um, I think it was John Carrier. He said, oh, well, you mean we're talking about telling him about going on a cruise, you know. And, and he said, oh, it's, is it all inclusive? And, and I said, uh, 
you know, with this brilliant, fast mind as I had, I said, uh, I don't know what's inclusive. What's all inclusive? And he just looked at me like, oh, where'd this guy come from? He said, it means did, did everything, all your meals, everything included. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The word salvation means all the blessings of God, they're all inclusive. They're already included with the package. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. But it, it's, what's it, part of it talks about salvation. You receive salvation. Saved. All inclusive. Healing. The blessing. All of it. Salvation. For you to get born again, God doesn't have to get up off of his throne. The Holy Spirit is here. He brings the word to pass. Ministering angels are involved also. We're not going to get into all that today, decipher all that, but um, all I had to do, all you had to do is, hey, Jesus was crucified physically a little over 2,000 years ago. But the Bible says he was crucified from before the foundation of the world. In God's eyes and in his heart, it's a done deal. All the miracles and everything you see before Jesus physically went to the cross, that's what they were based on. He was crucified before the foundation of the world was laid. That's what the Bible says. And so, after Jesus went to the cross, for us to be born again, he didn't have to get up off of the throne. He didn't have to do anything. There's a spirit world out there. And we, he said, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. Right? It, it's like, as I say, I use a lot of time, it's like the law of gravity. It's already in motion. It's already there. You don't have to do anything because God, word, His Word upholds it. He set it in place when He created the earth. So He doesn't have to, every time a plane takes off in the air, He doesn't have to tell gravity to operate like it's supposed to. That's right. You know, when a, a plane crashes, you've never heard them one time ever come back and say, well, sometimes they say, we, we can't, we, we don't know. They'll search for, for years can never come up with a conclusion as to why that plane crashed. But never one time have you ever heard them say, well, we believe that on this day, at this certain time, uh, gravity spiked. No. It, it's a fixed. It's, it's, it's there. It's, it's always the same. God's word and his promises, they're fixed and they're always the same. He, he doesn't go around changing them from one situation to the next. If you find out what his word says, and especially when he speaks it back to you, when the Holy Spirit brings it up to you and says, apply this to your life right now. This is what you, you, a lot of times I'll ask the Lord, most of the time, when I'm facing a situation, Lord, what do you want me to say about this? You understand? It's his word. What do you want me to declare about this situation? How do you want to handle it? Where is my faith at? What scriptures do I need to stand on? Because that's the only place your faith comes from. If you're just using that base, just, well, I just believe this, and, and I, I'm just going, you know, I'm just, I just believe this. And, so I, I'm, and I know you may have some scriptures there that's down in your heart you may be considering, but... When I pray over something, I declare those scriptures. Here's what the word of... I'm not trying to convince God. I'm trying to keep me in faith. Right. The enemy doesn't care what the word says. He's still going to come and, and try to steal it from you. He don't care what God's word says. But you're the one that's got to stand on it. He says, fight the good fight of faith. The faith, the fight of faith is over you holding on to the word of God no matter what the circumstance say. And you say, no, I'm not moving off of this. I don't care if it looks like everything around me is crumbling. I got a little foothold right here, and I'm standing right here. And I'm not moving, because this is the pedestal. This is the firm place of God's word. That makes sense to you? Jesus said, when he said, well, I, when the Son of Man comes back, will I find faith? He's talking about unfeigned faith, unwavering faith. James says, if a man wavers... He said, that man should not expect, that's what James said, that man should not expect to receive anything from God. Is God just bad and mean? 
No, he set his word out and it's like a law. Just like the law of gravity. It's there. If you stay in faith, it can happen. I remember I started telling it where they came to cast out the devil in a man's son and, and they couldn't. He said, Lord, I brought my son to your disciples and, and they couldn't do nothing for him. He said, if you can help me, if you can do anything, help us. And the Lord said, uh, basically he said, no, he said, if you can believe. Now, yeah, the Lord took authority over this evil spirit, but <clears throat> it wasn't all the Lord. If, if, if it was just all Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, why did the Lord say that? He said, no, if you can believe unwavering faith, if you're, if you're fixed, your faith is fixed and it's firm, he said, all things are possible to him that believe it. Right. And now what he said? Yeah. Well, why did he say that? If it's just all Jesus. Jesus went to his own hometown and he said he was astonished. One place said he was, he was astonished at their faith. The one man's faith when he said, just speak the word only. But when he went to his own hometown, <clears throat> he said he, he couldn't do many mighty works there, just minor things. Don't you know he, he knew those people personally? He wanted to do for them. He knew. I know Sister So-and-so. She's been having trouble a long time. <clears throat> and now I've entered into this place. The anointing's on me. I won't set her free. He was just getting started. And he said he was astonished at their unbelief. Because he, the Son of God, with God Almighty, the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit inside of him, he could not <clears throat> do any mighty works there. Was it because he didn't want to? No, he wanted to, but he said he couldn't. Why? Because of their unbelief. What did they say about him? They said, who is this? Who does he think he is coming here? Isn't this Joseph and Mary's son? Isn't this his, his brothers and sisters over here? Who does he think he is? They didn't have any confidence in him. You know, sometimes we look at, people look at scriptures like this and they read it and say, you know, yeah, I know you just got to keep beating on God's door to get him to move for you. Yeah, I know he loves you, but uh, <clears throat> you've got to persuade him to do things for you. But that's kind of the way it, it's always been read. Yeah. No, it said he will speedily avenge them. If we have faith, unwavering faith. Faith that's fixed, it's firm on the word of God and will not take no for an answer. See this, did I ever read it? Yeah, I think I read it all. This, uh, <clears throat> this widow woman, she would not take no for an answer. Why? Because she knew, she knew for one thing, this king has the ability to help me and she knew what was rightfully hers. Whatever was going on, somebody was trying to cheat her out of something or do something wrong. She knew where she stood. So therefore, she said, uh-uh, I'm not giving this up. You know, if you go home today, and I've used this a lot of time, if you go home today, and they're the, they used to be what was called gypsies. When I was a little boy, we had gypsies. They're still, I still have some chairs out there under my barn that, uh, where we used to live on the Warm Springs Highway. About two doors up, they had a... a a nursery there for kids at one time. And then after it closed, Miss uh, McCurdy got older. They was a band, what they called gypsies. They just traveled around and, you know, had a little wagon-like thing, a truck. And, <clears throat> and they, man, they had a big pile of shavings out there. Oh, Lord, big old pile of shavings. They would take lumber, I guess. And I, don't know, I don't know how they cut it. I was too small. But they would make uh, chairs that you set out in your lawn. I mean, they were heavy duty, real thick wood. I still got some chairs at the house now. And my daddy had that I got them after he, he died. Uh, and, uh, but they were called gypsies. And so, so today, if you were to go home today after church and you got home and, and uh, I'm not negative towards people of that race or whatever, but that's what they were called back then. And so I say, if, if there was a band of gypsies in your house today when you got home and you looked and you thought, man, who's all these people here at my house? And, and you went to the door and they said, uh, excuse me, can I help you with something? You said, what are y'all doing in my house? And they said, this is our house. Uh, Granny is over here in her favorite chair. This is, you said, no, this is my house. You better get out of my house. And he said, no, Granny's over here in her favorite chair. This is where she always sits. <clears throat> what would you do? What would you do? Well, today, you know what? 
with the laws of our land today, they might get to stay there a few days until you went to court and got them out. Who knows? But would you just let them have it? Would you just say, well, I, I thought I lived here. I thought this was my house. I've been making payments on it, but <clears throat> would you just give up and say, I guess it belongs to them? Why? Because you know. Right. You know beyond a shadow of a doubt <clears throat> where you stand. You know that at the courthouse, <clears throat> there's a record there where you bought that house. You either have already paid it or it's showing that you're making payments until this date. Yeah. That's my house. And then you could fight a legal battle in court if you had to, and you would do it. <clears throat> you would be mad. Right. If you had to get a lawyer and take them to court and the police had to come out there and literally move them out of your house, you would do it, wouldn't you? Why? Because you know beyond a shadow of a doubt what belongs to you. Right. I believe too many Christians today don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt what belongs to them. That all the blessings of God are now yes. All the blessings, it said, are now yes and amen. Not yea, yea, and nay, nay. You know, sometimes God says yes and sometimes God says no. That's what people say. <clears throat> it's not what the Bible says. No. Is it? Can you take me there? It's what people quote. Well, sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God says no. <clears throat> well, if we're lining up with what he says, if we know what the promises are and what the requirements are, then we know what belongs to us. <clears throat> and when the devil... All sickness and disease comes out of the curse. Poverty. I mean, you go to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and read it. Families are split up. He said, a, a man will, <clears throat> another man will, will have your wife and the house that you built and your children and, and the money. It tells all that. Right. It says any disease that's not listed here, anything that will be named down the years, it's included also. If it's not named here, anything that will be named, I'm... What do you call it? <clears throat> um, I'm ad-living, let's put it that way. <clears throat> it says it's included too. So if you're redeemed from the curse of the law, then what's left? The blessing. What blessings? Well, he goes on, he says, the blessing of Abraham. The promise of the Spirit. Thank God we have, that's the most important thing, the promise of the Holy Spirit. But what about all the blessings of Abraham also? Used to, when I was growing up, they said, oh, that's some of them Jews. You know, Jews were always blessed. They made money. We had some here in Manchester. Yeah. I forget their name, but, you know, they always can see if they were a Jew. But you know why? Because the Jews believed in the covenant that Abraham made with God. And they believed they were under that blessing. They had faith in the blessing. Not in them being perfect and have given the right amount of money or been to the church. <clears throat> they believed they had faith and they stood on the blessing of Abraham is mine. Right. When Abram died, Abram was very blessed. Abraham was very blessed because God told him, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you wealthy. When they tried to give him the wealth, Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, no, 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 no. I want anything you got. You'll say, you made me rich. He said, I've made a covenant with God. I lifted my hand to God. When Isaac came along, the land was a mess. <clears throat> there was poverty. And uh, there was a famine. He was going down into Egypt like his daddy did. And God said, no, don't go down there like your daddy did. I want you to stay here in this land. I want you to sow. Told him where to sow his seed in this land. He said, in the time of famine, Isaac had a hundredfold return. He was so blessed, it was like his daddy. They wanted him to leave. You're getting too big for us. <clears throat> you'll, be, you'll be took over him. Yeah. Jacob, when Jacob came along, he believed in the time. He said, Lord, I'm going over this brook with nothing. He said, but when I return, if you'll bless me in my endeavors, when I come back into the land, I'll bring the tithe back into your land. I'll give you a tithe of all. And God blessed him. Why? Because of the tithe? No, it's because he had faith in the tithe. Because we have the blessing, but if we don't have faith in the blessing, 
It's not going to work for us. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, For they that come to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. They got to believe that He is a rewarder. <clears throat> From the time those Israelites, those Jews, <clears throat> were raised up, they were taught about the blessing of God, God's blessings on you because you're a Jew. You're an Israelite. They were raised that way. So when they grew up, <clears throat> they wouldn't tell them, hey, if you want anything, you're going to have to work and sweat and toil and nothing wrong with good hard work and sweat and toil. But they wasn't taught that way. That, hey, you, you know, the world system's out here and they're going to cheat you probably and you might make it and you might not. No, they said you put your trust in God and the favor of God's on the Israelites. is on the Jews. We're redeemed from the curse of the law. But see, we've been raised up all these years thinking that we're not free from that stuff. We still have to deal with it just like anybody else. We're just like the rest of the people in the world. No, we're not. God loves everybody, but He favors faith. Right. He does. He honors faith. When he, when he brought Jacob's children out, his 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 lineage out, the children of Israel. He said that group of people, it was set before the foundation of the world. They were to go into the promised land. <clears throat> but they didn't go. 40 years, 40, 45 years later, 40 years later, they went into the promised land, but the unbelievers died in the wilderness. Right. Only those that were taught faith Joshua and Caleb and the priest, they taught those new ones coming along that the blessing, the favor of God's on us, and they went in and took the land. They went in and possessed. But God got irritated with the other generation, and he said, they don't have any faith. He said, I've already given you the land. <clears throat> the angels are going before you, and they're going to drive out the inhabitants of it. And they said, uh-uh. Oh, yeah, the land's just like God said. It's a wonderful land, but we can't take it. It's, it's too much for us. He said, the land eateth up the inhabitants of it. He said, we're just like grasshoppers in our sight, and so were we in their sight. They'll crush us. Those are giants over there. How can I deal with that? We have problems today. We have sicknesses today that man cannot cure. How can I deal with that? Faith. Faith. But you know, we're raised up in unbelief. We hear people talk about faith, but then we see their actions around us that faith doesn't always work out. Right. Well, must not have been God's will. Maybe God's trying to teach them something. But we'll just keep pounding on the doors, knocking on the doors of heaven, and maybe God will send forth healing. No, He already provided it in the blessing, in the covenant when he redeemed us from the curse and said all the blessings now are not yea, yea, and nay, nay, but all the blessings are yes and amen. So be it in Christ Jesus. Not in ourselves, not in our good works. <clears throat> See, in 1992, this is my story, and I'm going to keep telling it because it's a good story to me. It tells the truth. I was religious. <clears throat> Still have religion in me. I know it, and I'm working every day to get it out. Any religion in there. But in 1992, I'd been born again for 14 years. <clears throat> Sometimes, you know, anyway, I was at a period of time I wasn't real spiritual. So don't ever count anybody out. Right. You know, at that time, anybody that had watched my life, uh, probably the preachers that had watched my life, they probably... Had I wasn't in there really. They probably counted me out. <clears throat> I counted me out. But the Lord didn't. He can get your attention. But anyway, after being born again 14 years, I found myself broke, busted, and disgusted. I was sick. I couldn't work. Closed my business down. <clears throat> God had blessed me. He blessed my little business. And the next thing you know, I was working seven days a week. Didn't have time for God. Oh. God didn't just shut it down. 
No, you start moving away from God, you start making the wrong decisions, you start doing wrong things, and next thing you know, I was in a mess. And I started blaming God. I, I've been a tither. I've been to church every time the door's open. Lord, I've done this, and Lord, I've done that. And he let me know along the way. He taught me how to be healed. That's the basis of this church. You get the word of God off of the page and get it into your heart. You get it in there so big. Jesus said in the book of Matthew, he said, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. When the pressure gets on, you know, you squeeze a tomato, anything, you squeeze anything hard enough, and what's on the inside is going to come out. You get the word of God so rich in your heart, it doesn't matter what, how much pressure is on. There's only one thing that can come out. That's what you've got in there. If you've got unbelief in there, it's coming out. But if you're so filled with the word of God and you know what belongs to you, just like this widow woman, she knew what was right and she knew this man can help me. I don't have any other hope. We don't have any other hope but Almighty God, the name and the blood and the stripes of Jesus Christ. We have it. It's available to us. It's set in concrete. And so <clears throat> I got the word so rich inside of me, it didn't matter how it felt. Only words of heat. I didn't have to force myself for it to come out. When he was hurting bad, I said, I'm healed by his strife. I am. As far as I was concerned, in my heart, in my mind was renewed. I wasn't thinking like the world anymore. I just said, look, I'm healed. I am healed. I'm, I'm healed. I'm redeemed. I'm healed. The next thing I knew, I woke up one morning and I was totally healed. And the Lord spoke to me and showed me in a vision at night. And he said, your body, I've healed your body. He said, but you take Matthew 16 and 19 and you use that. He said, I want you to bind the devil and loose my word in the earth by confessing it. That's the law of faith. You declare what God's word says over you, over a situation in your life and the word will work. Jesus said, the words that I speak not the words that's just on the page. Not the words I got bottled up in my heart. But he said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. They minister life to your spirit. But I can tell you something else. He said, the worlds, we, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. The word of God is not nothing. I used to say, and I've heard other people say, God made the world out of nothing. No, his word is not nothing. His word is substance. And when you declare his word, one day the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Well, these were thoughts that came to me. He said, son, I, you know, I was thinking about God anointing men. <clears throat> and he does. His spirit's in us. His word is in us. He said, I don't know but one thing, and that's my word. I know it. I bring life to my word. I watch over it to make sure it's performed. He performs it. He said, my word will not return unto me void. It will accomplish what it's set out to do. We have to get in the word. I use this widow woman today and this unjust judge. God's not lingering and holding back. Now, if you're dealing with finances sometimes, you have to, there's other people involved. God doesn't just counterfeit money as they say out of heaven. He's not a counterfeiter. He, Jesus said, give and it'll be given back to you. Press down, shaking together, running over, good measure to men give unto your bosom. Well, how much? According to the measure you meet. According to your faith. How much faith do you have in it? It's not the amount you give. It's do you have faith in it? Do you have faith that that's going to work? Because God told you to do it. Because the word says it'll do it. <clears throat> I, uh, <clears throat> I was in a tough situation, and for time I'll just make it short, but anyway, I didn't know I was going to have a need about three months from then. <clears throat> and the Lord spoke to me in, in a minister's meeting to give $800, which I didn't have. I think I, I said I borrowed it. I think I used a credit card <clears throat> to put the money in the bank to cover the check. Well, when the Lord told me there was a two, day, two or three days of meetings, 
it was daytime meetings and nighttime also. And so, you know, the, they passed the plate around every, every service. You know, the plate come around. And every time, the Lord say, put, put $50 in that. I saw I put $50 and I thought, well, that's probably all I, I need to give the rest of the meeting, you know, because I didn't really have that to give, to spare. I come to play it again. Lord, I, you, you just know the Lord's voice. He said, put $100 in there. And I thought, oh, Lord. Uh, I said, get behind me, Satan, you know, that kind of stuff. You're just trying to get me in a mess. And I thought, Lord, I don't have the money. Anyway, over the course of those two or three days, I gave $800. I mean, it was just, you know, don't, you don't do anything I've done. You wait till the Holy Spirit speaks to you. Well, see, I didn't know the need that I was going to have, but I had confidence. I knew God was speaking to me. I had confidence that this will pay off. This is, I'm not trying to get God to do something for me. I'm being obedient to what he spoke to me in my spirit. And so I went for three months, and it got tough. I had a construction house going working on a house, remodeling, I had construction loan, and I don't think it ever happened before, but anyway, I got, was 90 days behind on my construction loan. And I was calling them, I mean, I was calling them, you know, and saying, hey, I'm working on it, but, uh, you know, so finally, I called them, that time is 90 days, and I knew it's something's gotta be done. So I called them, and I said, look, you know, can you work with me? And they said, look, if you don't have it, they were, they were nice, they said, but we've got to have it, before lunchtime tomorrow, if we don't have it by lunchtime tomorrow, even if you send it, it's out of our hands. It's going in the court system, and we can't even take your money. And it just rose up out of me. I said, you'll have your money. And I thought, I hung up the phone. I thought, why did I tell them, where am I going to get $800? I mean, I needed $5,000. I thought, where am I going to get $5,000? I just dropped my tube belt, went to my home in Shiloh, and got on my knees, and when I say you can't buy a blessing, that's what I'm talking about. I was looking. I did have faith in the gift that the Lord had told me to give, but I was pushing buttons and pulling levers. If, if you Like a computer. You put the program in there. A lot of people try to do what somebody else has done and, and try to make what God told them to do work for them. Well, if it worked for them, it'll work for me. Well, the principal will, but you need to be led by the Spirit. And uh, you, you've got to be in faith over it. You just look and say, well, maybe it'll work for me. It worked for them, maybe it'll work. Oh, you've got to have unwavering faith in it. So I went home, dropped my tube belt, and I said, Lord, I don't know what's going on, but uh, whatever happens, I have confidence in you. Somehow, you're going to take care of this. I don't know what's going to happen. If they put my name in the papers and I'm not paying my bills, nobody's going to listen to me preach, but I said, I have confidence in you. Before that day was over, my wife was working down here in the flat uh, for Royal Elaine Nursing Home doing the paperwork. And she called me and she said, somebody just came by here and brought an envelope with your name on it. And that's the one and only time she didn't know what kind of situation I was in financially. I said, my Lord, girl, open it. See, what's in there? <clears throat> and she opened that thing up and looked and it was a check for $8,000. And uh, I mean, that's not the biggest blessing we've ever had by a long shot, but still, that was a big blessing for us at that time. And uh, when she said that, the Lord said, that's your return on your seed you sowed down there. See, I didn't know what kind of need I was going to have at that time. But faith, I heard the voice of God, and I stepped out in faith, and I didn't waver. I said, the return will be coming. But, you know, when what the reason I told that is when Somebody else, people think, well, God was lingering. God was trying to teach you something. Well, he'll use any situation. But when you get other people involved in your situation, God's not in control of any of us. He's not going to force anybody. He may move on you to do something good to somebody else, but if you linger and drag your feet, or I linger and drag my foot, if you have to, he'll get somebody else. That's right. So the person that gave that offering said, I've been trying to figure, I've been wrestling over this for three months, trying to figure out what to do with this gift. I didn't need it but three months before. But see, when God's dealing with, when you got finances involved, it's not God lingering. He's dealing with other people. Sometimes he's dealing with us trying to help somebody else. So don't linger. When God speaks to you to do something, no matter what it is, for somebody else, 
Hey, just say hey. He said, oh, this always be good to the household of faith. Amen? And I'm running long, as I normally am. Oh, there's just so many times the Lord showed up in my life. And he's blessed us because I had faith in him. Not because of, I had faith in myself, but because I had faith in him. I'll, I'll just take a few more. I'll just take a few more minutes. One time an individual owed me $5,500. It started off at $20,000, but he paid it down to $5,500. I had borrowed it from somebody else. So the individual owed me $5,500, and I kept going by there. You know, hey, can you... You got anything you can give this month to pay on that bill? Month after month, got down to that, and it just I just could see they were just not going to pay anymore. And so I went by there again. I didn't even mention the money. <clears throat> but I see I was holding it against them. I had, to, I had to pay it back to the other people, and I was paying it the best I could. But see, I was holding it against that individual. So I went by there again, and I saw the individual, and I didn't mention the money. I thought, you know, I'll just let them... Let's let them say something. They never did. And when I left there, I could take you to the spot in the road. I said, Lord, you can make that individual give me my money. I said, Lord, I, I owe it. And I've got to pay it. But they're the ones that owes it. I said, you can make that individual give me my money. And I heard the Lord so clear in my spirit. He said, son, if you can't forgive, I can't forgive. And I knew what he was saying. He said, forgive the man of the debt and move on. You're getting into strife. You're getting into uh, unforgiveness. I can't work with that. You're, you're tying my hands in a sense. And so I said right then, that's it. That debt is forgiven. It's, 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 it's gone. They, that individual doesn't owe me anymore. And at that point, I put my faith in God. That's when things changed. I put my faith in him like Jesus said in Mark 11, 22. He said, have faith in God. Don't have faith in your faith. Have faith in God. And I said, Lord, I choose to do the right thing. It didn't feel good. I'll be honest with you. When I made the choice, but I knew it was the right thing, I had a word from heaven. A word from heaven is just like the B-I-B-L-E. When God speaks to you, however, it's his word. And I knew what he was saying. I'll take care of it. And I said, Lord, you know I owe those people that money. And if I have to pay it a dollar a week, I'm going to pay that note. But I said, you my help. And I put my trust in you. But I've done what was right. See, I, I was in faith then. In less than three months, the Lord put an extra $16,500 in my pocket. And I basically done nothing for it. Didn't spend any money. Just a blessing through a business thing. I wasn't even a partnership in it. But my name was on the checking account through another business thing I was involved in. I made more money out of it than the man that had all the money in it. When he come down to close the deal out, he, I said, uh, what you want me to do with it? You know, we finished these deals up. What do you want me to do? He said, well, how much money is left in the account? And I told him, and he said, well, write a check to this person for that much. Write this much to uh, his organization. And I said, well, what you want me to do with the rest of it? He said, well, just write a, self to, a check to yourself and close the account out. And my part was $16,500. I was able to go pay the $5,500 off give tithes and offerings off of the $5,500. I mean the $16,500. Then I had a blessing in my pocket. Amen? Yeah. But see, I put my faith unwavering in the Lord. I can't. I'm just like the widow. I, I can't pay this. At that time, I didn't. I, I can't pay this. I put my trust in you. Amen? Right. Jesus said, when I return to the earth, Will I find any unwavering faith? There's only one way to do that. You have got to hear God's voice. And this is it. And if you get this in there in abundance, it'll come out of your mouth. And when you get in a tight spot, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance those things I've said to you. See, he didn't preach a sermon to me that day. He just said, if you can't forgive, I can't forgive. There's been many other occasions where the Holy Spirit would bring the word up to me. Wherefore did you doubt and brought blessing to us? 
Just because of that. Over money, finances, over healing. Let's stand up this morning. Faith has to be unwavering. And I wish I could tell you that I was at that point and I never wavered over anything, but you know what? This old world and the enemy working in it is very deceptive. And it distracts us. I mean, some things we have to do. We have to be involved in. But you know, there's a lot of other time that we use that is not really necessary. But being in the Word of God is necessary. How much is it are you willing to pay for unwavering faith? Well, I need to know what's going on in the world. Well, that won't solve your problems. It'll put fear in your heart. All kind of things. They take our time, and our time is the most valuable asset we have. Right. And the most valuable place we can spend it is in His face, and that's in the Word. And that's where faith comes from. And if we get it in abundance, as Jesus said, when the pressure gets on and you get squeezed, only one thing can come out. If you filled with the word. But if you filled up with all kind of stuff in the world and there's anything, most anything can come out under pressure. So we can walk in unwavering faith. We can do it. Let's just do it. Amen? Hey, just... Just like you do with life. You set goals and say, hey, you may not be there right now. And it may look a long way off, but I'll tell you, it'd probably be quicker than you think. You say, look, I got a goal set. I guess you set goals lifting weights probably, don't you? Or have at times. I got this one. I, at a certain point, I want to be able to lift this much weight or do whatever. I'm going to set some goals. We set goals in life. You was talking about you went to school and got some degrees. And you had to set some goals. It took time, but now you got it. You can set goals for your faith, but you have to maintain it. Father, we thank you today for your word. That's where our faith comes from. But it's only as you reveal it to us, as we spend time. Lord, you said if we valued your word, you would unfold it to us. You would reveal it to us. But if we didn't value it, then we lose it. Lord, stir up every one of our hearts, especially in these last days to know that the most valuable and important thing that we have is your presence, your word, not just what I think or what I believed in the past, a religion. Help us, Lord, to be conformed to your image, your thinking, and your faith. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're watching, still watching uh, through that lens, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, all you have to do is call on him and say, Lord, Come and save me and do something with my life. If you need healing in your body, all you have to do is claim it. If you uh, need something, you can call us. We'll get in touch with us. Uh, we don't need your name and number to get money out of you. We just want to get God's presence and the blessing of God to you. Have faith and don't waver. Amen.